echo from the ages. If a man has accused another of laying a death spell upon him, but has not proved it, he shall be put to death. That was the first law inscribed by Hammurabi, empire builder and first lawgiver in history, 1700 years before Christ. This is Face to the Future, a new transcribed series on this station produced in cooperation with the North American Air Defense Command. Its conductor is Del Vina, well-known broadcaster, author, lecturer, a lady of adventure as well. It's Face to the Future, and here is our hostess, Del Vina. Welcome again to Face to the Future. In the relatively simple life of most of us, Law is something which protects property and property rights and catches up with us when we're doing 50 in a 35-mile speed zone. If the law has trouble catching the speeder every time and we get away with it once in a while, consider the plight of law and its practitioners who must try to catch up with a world whose jurisdictions are spreading far off the Earth's surface. Some of it was recently indicated in an article on international law in Time magazine. If a Swiss citizen were to get tired of his wife and throw some arsenic in her martini as they were flying on a British airliner from the airport in Frankfurt, Germany, to Paris, France, the question might be, which country should prosecute? Would it be Great Britain, because the, the plane is a British airliner and chartered by the British Empire? Or would it be France because the plane would land at the Paris, Orly, or Le Bourget airports after the crime had been committed, where the body would be removed by the gendarmes, who would also arrest the husband. Or would the case have to be pulled all the way back to Switzerland, because the crime had been committed against a Swiss citizen by another Swiss citizen? Or would it have to come to German courts, because each nation has jurisdiction over the airspace above it, and the arsenic was dumped in the martini while the couple was still over Germany. Or could it conceivably be turned over to some international court of justice in The Hague, in the Netherlands? Confusing, isn't it? Let's think about this for a moment. While this problem is currently being tackled under auspices of the United Nations, and some 27 countries have had their representatives at work on it, there are other developments much farther out than this with which we must contend. Just before Russia's Khrushchev came to America for his visit, his country's scientists had landed a rocket payload on the moon, and part of that payload was the flag of the Soviet Union. In other times of exploration, the planting of the flag amounted to staking a national claim. Since then, Russia has photographically mapped the backside of the moon. To get at some of the implications of this, I turn to political expert Dr. Hilton Goss, once a member of the faculty of the Air University. It certainly indicates the problem of, of what international law will do uh, to extend itself into the space realm. Uh, International law, as you probably know, is still uh, operating on the basis of the old maritime uh, conditions of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, where uh, the distance of uh, jurisdiction uh, related to the distance a cannon aboard a ship could fire. Uh, when you uh, project that into the age of the airplane, uh, international law uh, has not uh, caught up uh, in the least uh, with happening since 1903. And now uh, you take that further out into space, uh, international law, of course, is in, in a, a very uh, serious uh, condition to cope with the problems of uh, possible exploration and utilization and uh, manipulation of uh, territory on the other planets. So here we are, a nation which only recently had range wars about barbed wire fences on the open grazing lands of the West, something still in the living memory of many people. 
and we are beginning to deal in the fenceless realms of space, where laws and their enforcement are far tougher to handle than any barbed wire ever was. Here is New Zealander Sir Leslie Munro of the United Nations. I think the impetus came, so far as we were concerned, from Sputnik. That certainly started us thinking and talking about this matter in the United Nations, where in any case there are a great many lawyers. I suggested that the United Nations was the proper forum because the small powers could be heard. And as the representative of a small power, and one who believes that the great powers are not necessarily a monopoly of wisdom, uh, I think that uh, we are entitled to speak, and it is only really in the United Nations that we can make ourselves be heard. And in any case, as this is an international matter, and does not, I think, really allow for claims of sovereignty, and as we are concerned about control, then obviously the proper forum is the United Nations. Our approach to the legal aspects of space is a somewhat genderly one. But the Russians, with their achievements beyond the atmosphere, are not above using space as a legal weapon to achieve political and military advantage. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Here's Sir Leslie again. The Soviet Union asked that the banning of the use of cosmic space for military purposes, the elimination of foreign bases on the territories of other countries, and international cooperation in the study of cosmic power be included in the provisional agenda of the United Nations. You will observe, by the way, that um, the Russians link this matter up with the elimination of foreign bases on the territories of other countries. I completely disagree, by the way, with um, uh, that uh, connection. Many a gimlet legal eye is being put to the space area. Each statement of a world leader, and whether or not he's disputed, is being filed and gone over for foundation stones or possible legal precedent. Here is Dr. Oscar Schachter, General Counsel of the United Nations, on some of the legal lighting of the way already. We've had satellites up in the outer space. We've had statements by the President of the United States. We've had uh, uh, ample opportunity for other states to object uh, to the assumption of the the United States and the Soviet Union that they had the right to send the satellite. It seems to me, uh, therefore, that we can even conservatively um, accept the at least the inception of a legal rule that outer space, wherever it begins, uh, uh, is not subject to sovereignty. Uh, and uh, uh, in the classic international law phrase, common property belonging to everybody and incapable of being appropriated by a single state. While the short-range cannon could once decide, the far-ranging space vehicle so far denies anything in the way of enforcing, policing, or military destructive action. The urge to get on with workable international law and to use law as an instrument and justice as an instrument in settling international disputes has intrigued thoughtful men the world over. It was a main point with the American Bar Association conventions, and President Eisenhower, on his recent trip to India, addressed himself to the increasing importance of law and the rule of law. A world of swift economic transformation and growth must also be a world of law. The time has come for mankind to make the rule of law in international affairs as normal as it is now in domestic affairs. This is so, I believe, for one good reason. If an international controversy leads to armed conflict, everybody loses. If armed conflict is avoided, therefore everybody wins. It is better to lose a point now and then in an international tribunal and gain a world in which everyone lives at peace under a rule of law. All 
of this may seem strange to think about. World law or international law, space law. They seem to be odd to engage us when the dockets of most courts are loaded with so many simple infractions of the law and highly complex by today's standards, appeals for position and adjudication. This kind of law dealing with intimate human relations will go on and be needed. When Hammurabi wrote his laws 1,700 years before Christ, they covered trial, fines and punishments, slavery and property ownership, marriage, divorce, alimony and protection of children. Law will never depart from these concerns. But listen to Andrew Haley, General Counsel of the American Rocket Society, as he projects law and some of its concerns in the year 2000. A large number of problems will have uh, <clears throat> then crossed the path of humanity. We will have uh, colonies on the moon. Uh, the moon may be an independent, uh, should by that time be an independent entity of its own and uh, not subject to jurisdiction on Earth. We'll have problems of relationship with the moon, uh, undoubtedly with Mars and maybe Venus. We'll have meteoritic mining. We undoubtedly will have uh, colonies of people living on the uh, the minor planets, what they call the asteroids. Uh, and there will uh, then be a body of law uh, involving immigration and emigration. Uh, there will be a whole new civilization uh, and with all the legal problems that uh, uh, go with uh, such changes, there will undoubtedly be many more when the year 2000 comes along. I put down his first law. He said in effect that unless a man had his facts straight and was honest in their presentations, he would come to no good end and the law would see to it. When man submitted to the rule of law, he took his longest step from the lesser members of the animal kingdom. He has, however, some reservations about law standing alone, locally, internationally, or spatially without some means of enforcement. In any local community, it's the policeman who watches out against the intruder. In the national community, it's the military forces whose readiness and quality stands off the enemy. Weakness of either makes law a mockery and all mankind unsafe. This has been Face to the Future, a transcribed series on this station produced in cooperation with the North American Air Defense Command and featuring Delvina with her parade of interesting guests. Be with us next time as we put our face to the future. <laughs>